welcome to Community Christian Church. Thank you for joining us today. If we haven't met, my name is Jeff Butler and I'm the lead pastor here. The service will start in just a moment. It'll be about an hour long. We'll sing together, share a message from God's Word about the God of Second Chances, and we'll take the Lord's Supper together. So you might want to get something to eat, something like a bread or a cracker and something to drink, an old grape juice or wine, or just some kind of beverage that you can use later on in our service when we take the Lord's Supper together. Right now, I'm going to pray, and after I pray, Jean Craft is going to come and read some scripture for us, and then we'll begin singing together. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, we're thankful once again for this time to stop and pause and to be reminded about what a great God you are. So Father, we pray that as we spend this time together, once again, we'll be drawn closer to you, that by focusing on you, we'll feel more your love for us and your power to work in our lives. We're thankful for being together. We're thankful for this medium that allows us to do that. And we pray, Father, that you'll use it powerfully today. In Jesus' name, amen. Mark 12, 28 to 31. One of the teachers of religious law was standing there listening to the debate. He realized that Jesus had answered well, so he asked, Of all the commandments, which is the most important? Jesus replied, The most important commandment is this, Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one and only Lord. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. Good morning, church. We are so glad that you have joined us this morning. We want to let you know that we are so glad that we are able to worship God together, even through this media, that we are here at the church building, and you are watching us from your place. Uh, we are hoping that today you can rejoice as we sing and worship God together. He is good, forever good. where you are, lift up your heart to God and thank Him for His love. Sing with me. 
Well, good morning. It's great to be with you. We're going to save the Money Talk series until we get back together in person on April 25th. Today, I want to talk to you about how great our God is, how wonderful He is, how gracious and compassionate He is. We have a God of second chances, not just a second chance, but a third and a fourth and so on, which is why He's the God of second chances, plural, not the God of a single one second chance. Let's face it, we all need second chances, and success in life comes from taking them. We all need them, God gives them, but we don't always take them. The great people in the Bible were the people who needed and took second chances. We often assume they didn't need second chances, but we would be wrong. Abraham is a great example. Now, as you know, originally his name was just Abram, and the name gets changed to Abraham later on. So I'll try to keep it straight when he's Abram and Abraham, but I might get mixed up, so you'll know who I'm talking about. He was a great man of faith, so we might assume he didn't need any second chances. He was one of the Bible superstars. He's called Father Abraham. He's listed as one of the heroes of faith in Hebrews 11. He had great promises given to him. Listen to Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 5, where God calls Abraham and gives him a great promise. The Lord said to Abram, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. You will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram left, as the Lord told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran. They set out for the land of Canaan and they arrived. Imagine that conversation that Abram had with his wife Sarai when he got the news from God what he was supposed to do. He goes home and says, hey, we're moving. And she says, where? I don't know. You don't know? What kind of answer is that? Well, God hasn't told me yet. Okay, when he does tell you, tell you, you let me know then, and then I'll start packing. You don't understand, Sarai. We're to pack first, and then he will tell us where to go. What? God said, if you do this, I will do this. God said, if you go, I will guide you and bless you. It was a dangerous journey, but did you notice what was said at the end of verse 5? They arrived. They arrived in the land of Canaan. Abram did what God asked, God kept his promise, and they got there safely. He arrived safely, and once he gets there, they travel around a little bit. After all, they're shepherds, so they have to travel looking for fresh green glass and good water. God appeared to Abram again, and, and once again, he promises to give that land to Abram's offspring, and he'll have many, many offsprings. Abram builds an altar and offers a sacrifice. Everything goes well until, until there's a famine. Because of a famine, Abram decides to go to Egypt. He lives the, leaves the land God told him to go to and goes to Egypt. God did not tell him to go to Egypt. God told him to go to Canaan and he would bless him. God said, go to Canaan and I will bless you. He did not say go to Egypt. Even though the famine was going on, God does not tell Abram to go and leave Canaan. So why would he leave the land that God told him to go to and go someplace else? Because he didn't trust God. Abram didn't trust God, so he left and went looking for food on his own. He left the safety of God's provision for his own plan. God had promised that Abram's offspring would have the land. He didn't have an offspring yet, so obviously God wasn't going to let him die yet. But Abram didn't trust God, so he left. When he gets to Egypt, is he thinking, God will take care of me. I don't have to worry about anything. No, he wasn't thinking about it. That's why he left. I don't know exactly what he was thinking, but I do know he wasn't trusting God. And he has another problem. Listen to what he says to his wife, Sarai. Genesis chapter 12, verse 11. As he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife, Sarai, I know what a beautiful woman are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. And then they will kill me, but they will let you live. Say you're my sister, so they will treat, so, so they will be, so we will be treated well for your sake. And my life will be spared because of you. In other words, Abram's saying, I don't want to get killed. And because we don't trust God, or at least I don't trust God to take care of us, let's deceive the Egyptians. Let's tell them that we're brother and sister. Then you'll be added to Pharaoh's harem, which is not good, but at least I'll be safe. That doesn't sound like a great man of faith to me. 
Does it sound like one to you? Let's recap. Abram disobeys God, deceives the Egyptians, allows his wife to be added to Pharaoh's harem to save his neck. This shows a lack of trust in God. So God says this, I've had it with Abram. I'm going to abandon you to the mess you've gotten yourself into and go find somebody else. No. He intervenes. He protects both Abram and Sarai. He reveals the true situation of Pharaoh in such a dramatic way that Sarai was released and she and Abram are sent on their way with extra money and wealth given to them. Rather than abandoning him for his disobedience, his deception, his treatment of his wife, his lack of faith, God gave Abram a second chance. God intervened to save him. That's grace. That's a second chance. And here's what I want you to understand about the God of second chances. He is faithful even when we are faithless. God is faithful even when we are faithless. Abram did not stop really believing in God. He didn't really reject God, but he was not faithful in trusting him. Our faithfulness, our faithlessness does not end our relationship with God. Our faithlessness does not end his love for us. God's faithfulness is not conditioned on our always being faithful to him. And that's why we get second chances. 2 Timothy 2.13 says it this way, If we are faithless, he will remain faithful, for he cannot disown himself. It doesn't say if we're faithful, God will be faithful. That's obviously true. It says that when we are faithless, he will still be faithful. And that's good news, isn't it? If you agree, type amen in the chat box. Let me ask you, have you always been faithful to God? Have you always been obedient, always trusting? If you say yes, then you're a far better person than I am, and you're probably a liar. We have all been faithless at some time. And here's the good news. God doesn't abandon us just like he didn't abandon Abram. God is faithful even when we are faithless. Well, Abram eventually returns to Canaan. He goes back there. He becomes prosperous. So prosperous that he and his nephew Lot have to go their separate ways. There's just not enough land for both of their flocks together. So they divide. Lot ends up going to Sodom and Gomorrah and he gets captive in a war. So Abram goes and rescues him. God sounds, sounds blessed to me, you know what, that Abram goes and, and rescues him and takes care of him. Sounds like God is still taking care of him. But the years go by and Abram still has no son. So he gets a little testy and complains to God and he still doesn't have a son. So what does God do because Abram has complained to God? He strikes him dead, right? No. What he did is God spoke to him once again in a very dramatic way. God reassures him that he would give Abram a son and give him all the land of Canaan. Abram trusts God. Abram believed God. And scripture says God credited his faith to him as righteousness. Well, just as Abram was getting impatient with God, so was Sarai. She was impatient too. So listen to the plan she comes up in Genesis 16 too. Genesis 16 too. So she said that Sarai to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my maid servant. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarai said. Now, this was a common practice that back then. It seems odd now, but it was a common practice back then. And Sarah may have looked good for a 75-year-old woman, but she was not as young as Hagar. So, verse 3. So after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarai took her Egyptian maidservant, Hagar, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar, and she conceived. Rather than waiting for God to fulfill his plan and promise, Sarai and Abram came up with their own plan, which they implemented. Instead of Abram being exclusively faithful to Sarai the way God planned it, that's what God wanted, Sarai urged him to have sex with Hagar. You might say, in a sense, they raped her because she was a slave and didn't really have a chance to say no in the matter. That was kind of what she had to do. This doesn't sound like God's plan to me, does it you? Hagar gets present, pregnant, but immediately, once she gets pregnant, there's conflict between Sarai and Hagar, which only seems logical. I mean, Hagar is mad at Sarai, and Sarai is jealous of Hagar. There's a conflict between Sarah and Abram about her, which is also understandable. How dare you sleep with my maidservant and get her pregnant? She's mad at me now. And he says, what do you mean? It was your idea. It wasn't my idea. Sarai treats Hagar badly, so Hagar flees. However, God appears to her. He promises to take care of Hagar and her son, and sends her back to Sarai and Abram. She goes back. Genesis 16, 15. 
So Hagar bore Abram a son. Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son she had born. Abraham was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. So now we have further damage to the relationship. They brought a picture, a child into the picture, and this was not what God intended. You know who the descendants of Ishmael are? The Arabs. And who have the, have the Jewish people been in conflict for, with for centuries? The Arabs. The people, the Jews, you know, they're descendants of Abram and Sarah, and they've been in conflict with the descendants of Abram and Haggai ever since. That conflict came about because God was not trusted. Abram and Sarah did not trust God and came up with their own plan. If it would have been, God would have, would have been not, would faithful to them and would have filled at the right time. Now, if I would have been God, I might have said this. I might have said to Abram, Sarah, you blew it. You are off the team. You are fired. I'm writing you out of my will and out of my plan. But he is the God of second chances. You see, this is important for us to know that God is faithful even when we mess up his plan. God is faithful even when we mess up his plan. God gives us second chances even when we do things wrong. I probably shouldn't say mess up God's plan because you know what? God always knows what we're going to do and he takes our actions, our mistakes into his plan. Isn't that an amazing thought? We have a God who takes our mistakes and works them into his plan for good. That's why one of my and probably one of your favorite verses is Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all this, God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. We have a God who not only gives second chances, he makes second chances available to us. He wants us to take those second chances. We don't have to beg him for them. We don't have to plead for them. He is eager to forgive and restore us. I remember the story of an IBM executive. It was a kind of a junior executive who was engaged in a project and the project bombed. It failed miserably. It cost the company, you know, $10 million, which was a lot of money 20, 30 years ago. It's still a lot of money. And, you know, he went into his office and he says, well, I imagine you're here to fire me. And, and the guy says, fire you? No, what do you mean fire you? I just spent $10 million educating you and helping you know how to do things better. I'm not going to fire you. Learn from your mistakes and go forward. No matter how many times you mess up the plan, God fixes it, makes a new one, and gives you a second chance. He is the God of second chances. Well, many years later, God appeared to Abram again. God reaffirms his promise to him, changes his name to Abraham from Abram and Sarah from Sarai. God gives Abram the covenant of circumcision, something Jewish men wish he hadn't done, but, but he did. There are some ups and downs, but God takes care of Abram and Sarah. Time goes by. They continue to move around with their herds and flocks, and he comes to a part of Canaan called the Negev. Listen to what took place there. Genesis 20, verse 2. And there Abraham said to his wife, Sarah, say she is my sister. That's what Abraham wanted him to do once again. He says, Sarah, say you're my sister. Then Abimelech, the king of Gerar, sent for Sarah and took her. Sounds familiar. This is what they did in Egypt. Now face it, she's now 80 years old. I mean, how hot can she be at 80? But, you know, same thing happens. But this time, once again, they want to pull their trick you know, they keep doing that. They messed up before. They messed up with their plan of Hagar. And this time, you know what God says? I have had it with you, Abraham and Sarah. You keep making the same mistake again and again. I will not forgive you. I will not protect you. I will not continue working with you. You are off the team. That's what God said, right? No. Once again, God gives him a second chance. He intervenes through a dream. Before he sleeps with her, Abimelech finds out she's married to Abraham and he returns her to him. He gives him cattle and sheep and silver and says, live wherever you want in this land. Just please ask God to protect our people to heal us. We have a God of second chances. God is faithful even when we make the same mistake again and again and again and again. He gives us second chances. Not just after the first mistake, but after the second mistake and the third mistake and the fourth mistake and the fifth mistake, he is the God of second chances. Only the pe only people who need second chances get them. And who needs them? The people that mess up. We have the strange idea that the only people who get second chances are the people who always do things right. That's not true. They don't need second chances. In fact, there aren't any people like that because nobody always does things right. 
There aren't any people who don't mess up. There are no perfect people. They don't exist. Second chances are for imperfect people like me and you. Second chances are for people who make mistakes over again and again. And that's why there's another favorite verse of ours, Lamentations 3.22. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. It's easy to think that God should have given up on Abraham, but he didn't. Abraham and Sarah finally had the promised son, Isaac. Abraham's descendants multiplied and they got the land just as God promised. God is faithful even when we are faithless. God is faithful even when we mess up his plan. God is faithful even when we make the same mistake again and again. What a great God we have. Can you type amen there in the chat box? Well, here's one last thing that I want you to know today. God's faithfulness should motivate us to active faith and obedience, not apathy. Some think, well, it doesn't matter what I do. If God gives second chances, it doesn't matter what I do. I'll be forgiven, I'll get a second chance. That can lead to apathy. That can lead to more faithlessness and more disobedience and more messing up God's plan because people might abuse God's giving of second chances. Some want to deny or limit God giving second chances. And they might say something like that. You don't mean to say God really gives second chances so freely, do you? Well, yes. Yes, I do. That's grace. That's the gospel. That's the good news of Jesus. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't say, get it perfect, then I'll die for you. It's while we were still sinners, while we were still faithless. We we're messing up his plan again and again. Christ died for us. God offers second chances without our deserving or meriting them. But we need to remember, just because second chances are given doesn't mean all the consequences of our first bad actions are erased and don't exist. Bad consequences still can exist. Although at times God removes the bad consequences or lessens them, oftentimes they remain. I mean, Hagar still had Ishmael. There's still the Arab people who are a thorn in Israel's side. Arabs are loved by God just as much as the Jews, but that conflict between them still goes on. The point is not that there are no consequences, but there's no rejection. Consequences come because we live in a fallen world, and we experience the natural consequences of bad, time, bad behavior, and at sometimes the consequences of God's di discipline. But they're not finer. Final. In fact, they're often, often blessings because those consequences prompt us to turn to God, sometimes for the first time. People come to God in faith the first time because of the bad consequences they've experienced because of their disobedience and sin. And it's how people who are followers of Jesus, when they drift away, come back oftentimes because they've experienced some bad consequences. Oftentimes, those consequences, that discipline, leads us to go and get our second chances and be reunited with God. Listen to how God's purpose here in, in giving some consequences. It's because discipline leads to repentance. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 10. Our fathers discipline us for a little while as they thought best, best, but God disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. No discipline seems present at, pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness, righteousness and peace for those who've been trained by it. The consequences are not signs of God's rejection, but of his love, and they should be received that way. They are not indications of being rejected. They're indications of being wanted and desired. If he didn't do it, he just wants you to go off. That's why he does it, so he'll come back to him. So God disciplines to, to improve our character, to change us, and also so we'll come to him. At times, oh, it's simply his kindness that brings about repentance. Romans 2.4 says it this way. Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, tolerance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads you toward repentance? Now, there are uh, those who think that there are second chances for others, but not for me. Maybe you're one of those. You might say, yeah, somebody else can get a second chance, but not me. I've blown it too much. I've messed up too bad. I've gone too far for God. Now, it's true there are some places in Christ Scripture that seem to indicate there's a point when God doesn't give second chances, and we're going to read that in a minute. But rather than describing God as not giving second chances at some point, most of Scripture points to the fact 
that God gives second chances. And whenever somebody gets to that place, it's because they have moved too far away from God, not because God has moved away from them. Listen to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. Here's a trustworthy saying. If we die with him, we will also live with him. You know, in faith and baptism, we die with him, so we live with him. Verse 12, if we endure, we will reign with him. We've got to be overcomers, conquerors. If we disown him, though, he will also disown us. If we're faithless, he will remain faithful, for he cannot disown himself. It's not faithlessness, but disowning that seems to be the point of no return. Now, Christians disagree about this things. Some would say that, that they never really believed if they disowned him. They never were really saved. Others would say that they stopped abiding in Christ. They stopped staying close to Christ. I'm not going to try to resolve that today. It's, it's beyond my ability. Wiser people than me have been arguing about it for centuries. I only bring it up because some of you might be worried that you have been too faithlessness with God, that you have messed up too many times, that, that you're not deserving of a second chance. He won't give it to you that you're messed up too much, you made too many mistakes, you failed too much that God won't give you a second chance. Let me tell you this, as long as you want a second chance, God will give you a second chance. If you want it, well, you've not disowned Christ yet. You've not just gone that far from him. Nobody that's disowned Christ wants a second chance. The fact that you want a second chance means God will give you one. If you want one, you get it. The only person who doesn't get a chance, second chance, is the person who doesn't want one. And they don't care. They don't want one. God doesn't give up on us, though we might give up on him. If you want a second chance, you get it from God. Abram was a great person of faith. Not because there were not times when he was faithless. Not because there were never times when he messed up. Not because he didn't make the same mistake again and again and again. He was a great person of faith because he took the second chances that God gave him. Not just three times, but day after day after day during 25 years when God took him to the land of Canaan before he fulfilled the promise of giving an offspring to he and Sarah and Isaac was born. Do you want a second chance? You get it. Let me tell you how. Now there are two groups of people with us today those who are followers of Jesus, and those who have not yet become followers of Jesus. And the second chance is a little bit different for each. If you aren't a follower of Jesus, you start by becoming one. The second chance you need is to become a follower of Jesus, not just somebody who believes God exists and that Jesus is a pretty great guy. The second chance you need is to commit to following Jesus. You do admit that you have to admit that you've not been following him wholeheartedly. You have been faithless. You've not just messed up, you've sinned. You've broken God commands, and you need to turn your life toward God in trust and obedience. This is called repentance. Then you believe that God gives you a second chance because Jesus died on the cross to cover your sins, to pay your debt that your sins created. You believe that Jesus was the Son of God and he bought your second chance through his life, death, and resurrection. That's called faith. And the Bible gives us a way to express that repentance and faith. God has given a solid way for us to remember that we have turned to him in faith and we receive that second chance, that new life that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. And that's baptism. When you're lowered into the waters of baptism, it expresses a death to the old way of living, a turning away from it. It expresses a washing away of our sins. And then when we rise up out of the water, it expresses that we're rising to a new way of life. I'd love to explain this to you some more. And if you need some more explanation, type more in the chat box and we'll reach out to you. Or use our digital connect card where you can get more information or let us know you want to talk more about this or be baptized. It's at cccnyc.org connect. Now, if you've already received new life that comes from turning to Christ, but you've still been faithless or messed up or sinned and, and feel like you need a second chance and, and who of us haven't been there? You don't need to be saved again. You might need to repent and turn back to God because maybe you've drifted in disobedience. What you might want to do is what's talked about in John chapter 1, starting at verse 8. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Simply tell God what you've done wrong and that you want to do better. Most of all, though, you want him to cleanse and forgive you to give you that second chance, to give you the power and the urge and the Spirit's prompting to take advantage of it. 
If you're here today, it's proof that God is not finished with you. Don't give up on him. Don't delay in taking your second chance, either to start following Christ or by taking the next step you need to take to continue following him. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Now, I'm gonna pause here and uh, just a phone for, for a few moments and let you talk to God and then I'll pray. So there'll be a, a brief period of silence here, no talking by me. You pray and then I'll wrap up our time with the message by praying. Father God, we are so thankful that you are the God of second chances. And that makes you special. That makes you unique. That makes you wonderful. We are so thankful for that because if you didn't give us second chances, we would be lost. Father, we're so thankful for that. But help us not to take them for granted. Help us not to ignore your grace or, 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 or miss out on it. Help us embrace those second chances that you give us and help us do it quickly so that we no longer suffer the consequences of being separate from you. Father, we pray especially for those that need their turn light, do their lives over to you clearly and concretely. We pray, Father, they'll do that. But most of us watching are believers, but there's those areas in our life where we need to take a second chance. We need to ask for forgiveness. We need to take a second chance of obedience. Help us to do that. Help us to do it knowing that you love us, you care for us, you're rooting for us. You want us to succeed. You want us to be obedient and successful. We thank you for your love and your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for joining us. Hang around as we uh, sing praise to God and as we take the Lord's Supper together. Are you hurting and broken with Overwhelmed by the weight of sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's Spot with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is gone. Bring your sorrows and trade and joy for the ashes and new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was born with. Yeah.
bear your cross as you wait for the crown tell the world of the treasure you found
Happy Sunday. If you're listening online, you should have your bread or cracker and grape juice all ready. If you're at the building, you should have your communion kit. I'm going to be reading from John chapter 1, verses 29 through 32, from the New Living Translation. The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Look, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. He is the one I was talking about when I said, A man is coming after me, who is far greater than I am. For he existed long before me. I did not recognize him as the Messiah, but I had been baptizing with water so that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John testified, I saw the Holy Spirit descending like a dove from heaven and resting upon him. Now this scripture took place at the time Jesus was baptized right before he started his public ministry. So people at that time did not know much about Jesus. John did know that Jesus was the one that was much greater than him and came to take away the sin of the world. But he probably didn't really understand what that really meant. We can understand much better now because we are living after the facts took place. We are just coming out of the time where we've been remembering and focusing on the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. John might not have understood how Jesus could be the Lamb of God, but he knew that he was. He might not have understood how one man could take away the sin of the world. But we do. The Passover celebration was all about the Lamb's blood that was spread on the doorpost. Now, when we think of Jesus as being the Lamb of God, we think of a time when Jesus was being sacrificed and hanging on the cross for our sin. In order for our sins to be forgiven, we needed someone that was tempted and tried in every way that we are, but was without sin. Jesus is that person. He is the Lamb of God because he sacrificed his perfect life for us so that our sins can be forgiven once and for all. That is why we as God's children take communion every Sunday. We want to remember the sacrifice and love that Jesus has for us. So now let's take the bread or cracker which represents his body that was sacrificed for us. Now, let's take the grape juice that reminds us of the blood that Jesus shed for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing Jesus, the Lamb of God, to take and come down to this sinful world. We thank you for giving him up for us. Jesus, thank you for being willing to die on the cross for our sins. As we go through this week, help us to remember the sacrifice Jesus made for us and help us to make sacrifices for others so they can be drawn one step closer to you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Thank you for joining us. We'll be online again next week. If you want to connect with us or communicate in any way, the best way is to use the online connect card. You can find that at cccnyc.org slash connect. Also, if you want to give, if you're part of our church family or you just want to give a, a gift to God out of appreciation for him being the God of second chances, you can also do that at cccnyc.org slash give. Let me remind you that we have morning devotions Monday through Friday at 7.30 a.m. on Facebook, and we have a time of prayer and study of the book of Revelation on Thursday nights at 7.30. That's on Zoom. You can find links for all those at our church website, cccnyc.org. Thank you for being with us today. I'm going to pray, and then we can stay around and sing one more song of praise to God together. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the chance to be here today to connect this way. We're thankful to know that you are indeed a God of second chances. Help all of us to take those when we need them. And Father, we pray that you'll be with those that are suffering from the COVID virus. We pray that you'll strengthen their body, that you'll make those strong and able. We pray that your spirit will touch their bodies with healings. We pray this in Jesus' name. Sing with us and say, through you, through you, the blind will see.